This is the iPhone 14 Pro Max. It's got new cameras and new features, but are those enough to beat out the S22 Ultra to make this the best phone in the world? Today, I'll put these two to the test in seven different categories, and it won't just be about the most hyped features, but also the smaller details that actually make a big difference in daily use. And starting with their designs, probably one of my favorite features of the iPhone is MagSafe. It allows for some pretty elegant desk stands, but for me, the most practical benefit of MagSafe is a portable battery bank, because typically you have to bring around a cable and plug it in, and then it can get all tangled up, whereas a Mac MagSafe battery bank is extremely clean. It just magnetizes to the back of the phone. But you can actually add this feature to the Samsung with a magnetic ring or a case. And the Samsung can charge like this, so I think it's pretty worth it. But the S20 Ultra also does something that iPhones don't, which is reverse wireless charging. And I've used this a surprising number of times to charge my earbuds when I'm outside. But my favorite aspect of the S20 Ultra's design is that it comes with an S Pen. This thing isn't really useful for taking notes in school because the phone is just a bit too narrow. However, it's pretty good for annotating screenshots and documents, and in particular, writing reminders on the always on display is very convenient. It's also pretty helpful as a remote shutter button for when I'm trying to take my own photos. Okay, but physically, the difference that you'll feel the most between these two phones is their shape. The S22 Ultra has a squared edge at the bottom, while the iPhone has a squared edge on its side. And depending on how you hold the phone, both can be a bit uncomfortable. I personally would prefer a shape like the Pixel 7 Pro, where it's just slightly rounded on all the edges. But of course, a case can easily soften out the edges, so it's not a big deal. The 14 Pro Max is heavier, partially due to its stainless steel rim, which I really don't think adds that much in terms of overall durability, since the iPhone is still mostly covered by glass, and that's way more fragile. You definitely still shouldn't keep your keys in the same pocket as the phone. But also, more subjectively, I don't really like the aesthetics of the polished stainless steel rim because it catches a lot of fingerprints. I really wish this frame wasn't so glossy. Now, the S22 Ultra's aluminum frame is also glossy, but it's it's way less fingerprinty. And the S20 Ultra's USB-C port is over 10 times faster than the Lightning port for file transfer, which is a bit unfortunate because the iPhone supports ProRes and ProRAW, and both of those are massive. Those are also probably the file types that you'd want to edit on a computer. It's definitely quite a pain getting those big files off of the iPhone. And for unlocking these phones. So I think the iPhone's Face ID feels quicker sometimes because you don't have to press an extra button to unlock it, but you do have to aim it at your face. So when your phone is just laying on the table or too close to your face, it often doesn't unlock. And annoyingly, you can't just dismiss the Face ID right away. You have to wait until it shows you the password prompt. I feel like Samsung's unlock is less annoying overall. Its face unlock works pretty well, but unlike Face ID, it cannot work in the dark and it's also marginally less secure since it doesn't use a 3D scan. But the fingerprint on this thing is pretty fast, unless your finger is wet. And if nothing works, at least you can just swipe up to get to the password prompt immediately. Of course, both of these phones are very well built and designed, but I feel like with a USB-C port and an S Pen, the S20 Ultra just has a little bit more, so Samsung wins this first category. Next, let's take a look at their displays. I'm not a fan of Samsung's curved screen, mainly because it darkens the edges of the screen. And this is especially noticeable with lighter colors. Why would I want my phone screen to have like an almost vignette looking effect? So I much prefer just iPhone's regular flat screen. But beyond that, both of these are great 120Hz OLED screens. The S20 Ultra is a bit sharper and the iPhone can go a bit brighter. But to be honest, both of these differences aren't really noticeable. Although on the Ultra, you can have a convenient extra dim toggle, which I found pretty nice in dark environments. The iPhone has a low light filter, which also dims the screen, but it's a bit more steps to toggle it on and off. Now, the iPhone has True Tone and the Samsung has Eye Comfort Shield. It's kind of a funny name, but they're similar in utility. And unlike the 13 Pro Max, the 14 Pro Max screen actually got a wider color gamut as well. So now, just like the S20 Ultra, it also has full DCI-P3 coverage. The colors on both of the phones do look fairly similar, but that's when the Samsung is set to natural mode. When it's on vivid mode, which is actually the default, the colors are noticeably more vibrant than on the iPhone. It's not accurate, it, but I do think it's nice to look at. So objectively, I would say this is a draw, but personally, I don't really like the curved screen. And now perhaps the most important aspect, how it actually feels to use these phones in day-to-day -day life. 
So let's take a look at their operating systems. I think the universal back gesture that all Android phones have is a big advantage over iOS. For example, when I want to back out of search results in the YouTube app on the Samsung, I can just do a small swipe on the edge of the screen with my thumb. However, on the iPhone, I have to reach all the way across the screen to swipe back. Android's back gesture is kind of like a shortcut that I have no matter what the app's design is. And especially for larger phones like these ones, it can be very nice and helpful for navigating around the phone. Split screen is also only possible on Android phones. I don't really do it that often, but it's still nice to have. And I think the picture in picture mode is slightly better on the S22 Ultra for the reason that it can stay anywhere on the screen. On the iPhone, the picture in picture window has to snap to the corners. And since many apps have their UI elements either at the top or bottom, I find that I constantly have to move the picture in picture window on the iPhone just to get it out of my way. And Android also has this chat bubble, which is kind of like picture in picture, but for messages. When you receive a message, it'll pop up and then kind of just float on the side and you can text people back and also check your other messages without leaving your current app. So that's pretty nice. And also for the home screen, there's a lot more options in Samsung's One UI. The widgets come in all sorts of sizes and they can also be interactive. There's also different grid sizes for the home screen and you can put apps wherever you want. And with just one click, you can change the color palette or even apply an entire theme, which is something that I really like to do. And the first party Goodlock app just gives you way more options than you can even imagine. In comparison, the iPhone seems a little boring because it has none of that. There's no first party support for themes and the widgets also aren't interactive. However, the 14 Pro models do have the new dynamic island, which can be used by apps to display something like a timer countdown. You can also interact with it by pressing and holding down. So it's kind of like an interactive widget that can show you some useful information and that just floats on top of your apps. I definitely think the dynamic island has potential to be very useful. Overall, I think Sam Samsung wins for the home screen, but especially with the new iOS 16 update, the iPhone definitely wins for the lock screen. You not only can have multiple lock screens, which I think is really cool, but you can add widgets onto them as well. It's very nice being able to see things like the battery information and also the weather just at a glance on the lock screen. Now the S20 Ultra has what are called lock screen widgets as well. However, they're very different from the iPhone ones because they're not shown on the lock screen most of the time. You have to double tap on the clock to get to them. I usually don't have reason to do that, so I literally forgot they existed until I start working on this video. And what's really cool about the iPhone's lock screen widgets is that they can show up on the always on display as well. And not just that, but so can full notifications. And I've come to really appreciate this feature because often during the day, I just have my phone sitting on a stand on my desk. And because the notifications show up on the always on display, I can keep up with the important ones just by glancing at my phone screen. I don't even have to double tap the screen to wake it. By comparison, the Samsung's always on display can only show an icon for for each notification. And of course, that tells me much less. So functionally, I think the iPhone's always on display is much better, but I also prefer it more aesthetically because it shows a dim version of the lock screen wallpaper instead of just a black background. And surprisingly, while doing all of this, the iPhone's always on display drops less battery. I did a 10 hour test where I set both of the phones to airplane mode and then just let them sit with their always on displays. And the result was that the 14 Pro Max dropped 5% while the S20 Ultra dropped 8%. So the iPhone and it's always on display is more efficient. Okay, and a bit more about its notifications. So the iPhone's lock screen only shows you recent notifications, meaning that each time you check the lock screen, you'll only see the ones that have come in since you last checked and the rest of them will actually be in the notification center. Now, the Samsung's lock screen displays all of your notifications until you dismiss it. Its lock screen shows the same things as its notification center. The iPhone's lock screen might end up looking cleaner, but there are many times where I unlock my phone without looking through all the notifications. And I feel like I just miss a lot more notifications on the iPhone. And something unique to the Samsung software experience is Dex. It's pretty cool that with just an additional monitor, you can use this phone like a full-on computer. 
but I would say it's only nice for some specialty tasks. I feel like overall, it's still a bit too slow and also lacks many features to actually be a competitive desktop experience. And on the more functional side, the Android keyboard is much better. On the S22 Ultra in Gboard and the Samsung default keyboard, you can have a number row and also press and hold for punctuations. And both of those are super useful and definitely help speed up my phone typing. But neither of those features are available in iOS, even with third-party keyboards. So this is definitely a big category with lots to consider, but in general, I would say Samsung wins this one for its back gesture, the better picture-in-picture, -picture, customization, and also the keyboard. But now let's take a look at the cameras on these two phones. So the S20 Ultra's main lens, although it's 108 megapixels, it's not really sharper than the iPhone's 48 megapixel Pro RAW. In fact, I think the Samsung has a bit more lens artifact. Just look at the small tree branches here. The Samsung clearly has this purple fringing. And also, when it gets to the edge of the frame, the Samsung is also noticeably softer. Overall, the S22 Ultra's main lens is a little bit disappointing for having 108 megapixels. The iPhone's Pro RAW seems pretty impressive in comparison. Now, Samsung can do RAW photos as well, but it's far worse than Apple's Pro RAW because it just doesn't have as much processing going on, so it has way less dynamic range. Look at the sky here. It's almost entirely clipped on the Samsung photo, whereas the Apple Pro RAW has all the typical processing that gives it the much better dynamic range. Okay, and when it comes to the three times telephoto, it's also a pretty clear win for the iPhone. It's just got more detail, the textures also look a bit nicer, and when in low light, the advantage is even more significant on the iPhone. It's got way less noise and way more detail than the Samsung's 3x telephoto. Just look at the tree here. One looks completely normal, while the other one looks almost like a water painting. But when shooting things that are far away, Samsung does have the definitive advantage with its 10x telephoto lens. It honestly is way more zoomed in than you would expect, especially when compared to a 3x. I recently went to a concert and I couldn't get very good seats for it, and the three times telephoto pictures look like this. So it's still pretty far away. However, with the 10 times, I could get some really good quality close up shots. Digitally zooming in that far on the iPhone just isn't the same at all. I was really glad to have the 10 times telephoto for the concert. Okay, and for the ultra wide. So despite the S22 Ultra's ultra wide camera not even focusing, the results are actually pretty good. I would even say it's better processed than the iPhone in this shot here. The sky and the leaves just look a bit nicer on the Samsung. And in terms of overall sharpness, it's actually pretty close for these shots. Both phones have pretty good night mode as well, but I feel like the Samsung has a slight edge here. It tends to make the image look brighter, but it also preserves colors better. For example, if we look at the leaves here, but honestly, the most noticeable advantage of the Samsung is a selfie camera. It just has way shallower depth of field, and I think it looks much better than the iPhone, even though the 14 Pro Max has this new autofocusing selfie camera. But it's still no match for the S22 Ultra's selfies. And when it comes to video, with the main lens, the iPhone still clearly has an advantage here. In this video, the tree branches look quite a bit more crisp on the iPhone, and everything looks almost like slightly blurry on the Samsung in comparison. And the iPhone also has a huge advantage in terms of the cinematic or portrait mode, because one, it can shoot in 4K, but it can also focus on any subject instead of only faces on the Samsung. However, the cinematic mode is still not perfect because it can only do a decent mask with a more simple subject. If we look at this flower here, which has lots of edges, the mask still looks pretty fake. But the S20 Ultra does have quite a few more modes. They're pretty fun, and the pro photo and video mode can actually be very helpful. They let you manually control things like the ISO, shutter speed, white balance. And during the concert, which is a more challenging environment, I was able to get better footage with the pro video mode. However, the iPhone is much, much better at HDR video. It's actually on by default, and HDR videos look very bright and impressive on the iPhone itself. But do note that if you send it to other people, it may look kind of weird if they don't have an HDR display. On the iPhone, if I'm not going to be sharing the video with other people or online, I would definitely take it in HDR because it just looks much better. But the same thing cannot be said about Samsung HDR. It just doesn't look very good. Overall, it's way dimmer and it doesn't utilize the full brightness potential provided by HDR. It apparently is still in beta mode, so maybe it can get better with updates, but right now it just seems poorly processed. 
And the whole HDR thing is very well integrated with the iPhone's photo gallery as well. Even though technically photos don't have HDR, the iPhone has this view full HDR mode where it utilizes the full brightness potential of the screen to make the photos look just a bit more impressive on the iPhone itself. The S22 Ultra doesn't have a feature like this, so I find that the iPhone displays some kinds of photos a lot better on the Samsung. Both phones have a great set of cameras, and the Samsung's 10x telephoto is very unique. But overall, I think the iPhone's main lens and its 3x telephoto performance is better. And its videos are also much better, especially for HDR. And now let's zoom out a bit and take a look at these two phones' ecosystems. If your primary concern about the ecosystem is AirDrop and sharing clipboard, then actually you can do those things with any two devices very easily through an app called KDE Connect. It's available on all platforms, so you can do it with an iPhone with a Windows computer or an Android with a Mac. Book. Through this app, sharing photos and even ringing the phone to find where it is, is just one click. So the ecosystem benefits that cannot be made up by a third-party app are more so the smaller things. Apple has been working on their ecosystem for a very long time, so it is very refined. But Android with Windows is actually very good as well. Windows has this app called Link to Windows. Not the most creative name, but I actually prefer how it can show me all of the photos that I've taken on the S22 Ultra, and I can very easily import them into the computer just by dragging and dropping. I actually think this is more convenient than airdropping photos from the iPhone to a MacBook. The Link to Windows app can also show you all the notifications and messages that you got on the Android phone, and you can use the computer to call and text people. So it has a lot of the same features as the Apple ecosystem. However, the Apple ecosystem does still have its own advantages. For example, focus mode sharing for notifications. Calls and FaceTimes can be seamlessly handed off to the computer and vice versa, and AirPods auto switching is very good. And of course, Apple has iMessage, which may be important to consider if people in your life use that. Those are cool, but I honestly wouldn't choose my phone based on those alone. And Samsung has been building an ecosystem of their own as well. They have quick share between Samsung devices, which is pretty much the same thing as AirDrop, and Galaxy Buds auto switching is just as good. But I don't find it adds too much more beyond what KDE Connect can do. And also, Samsung laptops aren't that competitive at the moment, so I wish these features can be made available to all Windows computers. Overall, the ecosystems of these two phones is actually closer than expected. And since lots of the core features can be had for free with KDE Connect, I really don't feel like the ecosystem is that big of a deal, especially if you don't use things like focus mode, AirPods, and iMessage. I would say iPhone with a MacBook is honestly a draw against Android with a Windows computer. But overall, I would still say the Apple ecosystem is better for the small extra benefits. And now let's take a look at how long these two phones last. And in regards to that, let's see how fast they can charge. So the Samsung supports 45 watt fast charging, while the iPhone can only charge at 20 watts. So a 30 minute charge at max speed from zero gives you 70% on the S22 Ultra, but only 42% on the iPhone 14 Pro Max. But when it comes to the actual battery life, the iPhone wins by a pretty long shot. Whether it's running an intensive gaming benchmark or just scrolling around on social media, the iPhone drops around 25% less in terms of percentage. And these tests are repeated at different battery levels as well. The S22 Ultra is older, but it's still at 100% battery health and the degradation really wouldn't have made a difference to the results here. Even Apple's last gen A15 chip in my testing seems more efficient than the current gen Android Snapdragon 8 Plus Gen 1 chip. And the 14 Pro Max has the new A16 chip made on a new four nanometer processing node from TSMC, whereas the S20 Ultra is still on the older eight Gen 1 chip. So the iPhone is by far more efficient and longer lasting, even with a smaller battery. But honestly, both of these phones last a ridiculously long time. If you charge your phone every night, there's almost no way to run it dry, even with pretty heavy use. After two hours of social media scrolling, the iPhone and the S20 Ultra only drop 10% and 40 14% respectively. So it will take over 14 hours of social media scrolling to even run the S22 Ultra to 0%. And I've honestly never drained any of them to zero in my daily use. Maybe the 14 Pro Max can be charged every other day, but to me, that's not really a big advantage. 
But still, the 14 Pro Max wins the battery life category by a landslide. And as for performance, the iPhone is much faster as well. The 14 Pro Max model actually has quite a bit better thermal performance against the smaller 14 Pro. It was able to hold the score of 2500 for around 10 minutes, whereas the smaller 14 Pro drops immediately to 2300 after just four minutes. And this is much better than the S22 Ultra, which only peaked at around 2500. And after five minutes, it only had around 60% the performance of the 14 Pro Max. And it's the same story with Geekbench. The S22 Ultra is around 60% the speed of the iPhone for both single and multi-core tasks. However, benchmark scores certainly isn't everything. And day to day, I definitely wouldn't say the S22 Ultra feels 40% slower than the iPhone. And this is because most daily tasks are extremely easy Easy for both of these phones. Opening up an app and scrolling around on social media are both trivial. But of course, the iPhone's extra speed would be pretty useful for gaming. And during gaming, both phones reach around the same peak temperature of about 40 degrees Celsius. So both of these feel pretty hot. Again, objectively, the iPhone 14 Pro Max wins the performance category by a pretty large margin. Okay, so the new flagship iPhone wins four out of the seven categories. The S20 Ultra only won two of them, and one of them was a draw. This score might look pretty bad for the S20 Ultra, but it doesn't mean that it's a worse phone. I feel like depending on how you use your phone, the pen and also the 10 times telephoto lens can definitely be more worth it than anything the iPhone can offer. So the S20 Ultra definitely still has its place in the market, but overall, the iPhone's camera is a bit more consistent. It also lasts longer and the performance is better as well. For now, you can say the 14 Pro Max is a better phone, but I'm very excited to see how it will stack up against the upcoming S23 Ultra. That's it for this video. To learn more about the Z Fold, you can click right here.